It's my great honour and privilege to introduce Dr. David McDermott uh, from Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Centre. Um, I think one of the, the leading um, proponents of immunotherapy over the last 10 or 15 years to talk to us about T cell checkpoint inhibitors, A New Hope. David. Uh, thank you, James. Uh, I don't think I really know the answer to that question that we just had. I'm not sure I'll know it even better. I'll have a better answer after my talk. Hopefully, I'll have an answer. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to what my daughter calls the homeland. Um, I'd like to thank my cousin, Ray McDermott, for the invitation. This might be the uh, first meeting in scientific history where there are ever two McDermott's in the same symposium, which I think that's a good thing for us as a clan. Um, so, so one of the things I also find interesting about the talks that I get to give, I'm always glad to do it, but the, when I give the talks in, on the American side, my title is usually fairly straightforward. When I've given European talks, I always put a question mark at the end of my title. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is, but I think it has something to do with Dr. Gore. <laughs> anyway, all right, so we're here to talk a little bit about anti-PD-1 and a little bit of background on the pathway. Um, this is really a pathway that's commonly used more in the setting of infection, as you see here in an antigen presenting cell. Uh, to activate a T cell, you need two signals. Uh, to shut off a T cell, which you often want to do once the infection is controlled, you also need two signals, and there are these negative regulators or immune checkpoints that can shut off T cell function. It turns out that cancers can sort of take over this um, negative regulatory pathway by expressing PDL1 on their surface, as shown here. And we now have monoclonal antibodies, actually several of them in clinical development, that can block this interaction between the tumor expressing PDL1 and uh, the T cell expressing PD-1. So instead of the T cell becoming deactivated by this interaction, if you have a monoclonal antibody interrupting this interaction, um, you can actually activate T cells leading to uh, tumor cell killing. We've known for a long time in kidney cancer that PD-L1 is probably an important, plays an important role in the development of the disease. Work from the Mayo Clinic and other places have suggested tumors that express PD-L1 do worse. They're more aggressive, the shorter survival. So being able to interrupt this interaction may have an, um, an important role in some patients with this disease. So when we talk about what we're treating, um, when we're treating patients with PDL1, where we're seeing the most activity, I think we're probably seeing the most activity in what Tom Gajewski calls an inflamed tumor. And what does he mean by that? Well, a tumor that's expressing a lot of innate immune signals, that's expressing cytokines that are drawing T cells to the area of the tumor, but importantly, it's also expressing negative regulators um, that block the action of this immune infiltrate. So you have immune infiltration plus defense. This, you could think of it as barbed wire, the PDL1 expression on the tumor, and it's probably in these inflamed tumors where we're seeing a single agent activity. Um, as Bernard likes to point out, we've presented this probably 100 times. Um, there'll be more new data, fortunately, at ASCO this year. This is the phase one data um, for a very small cohort of patients on a very large phase one trial with nivolumab. The important points here is it's a generally uh, a tolerable agent. Grade three and four toxicity was not dramatic. Uh, we did see uh, deaths, three deaths due to pneumonitis, although now with an improved recognition that this can happen, those deaths are becoming less common, but still need, there are a lot of autoimmune-like toxicities that need to be monitored very closely. But we also saw an efficacy signal. Now this is probably the best we're ever gonna see with single agent PD-1 activity in kidney cancer, meaning once you go from phase one to phase three, you get less selected patients. So it wouldn't be surprising if the response rates and PFS decline. But what's probably still going to exist is this tail of the curve, maybe not as robust as we saw it in the phase one trial, but there's still patients out um, surviving off drug, what we'd like to call treatment-free survival, meaning these patients out here at two years, this is when treatment stops. And you can see five or six patients who are on this study who've gone at least a year without being uh, treated with anything and have yet to progress. So hopefully those patients have entered a remission of their disease, which I find um, pretty exciting. So um, what are the unanswered questions? Why well, I alluded to one of them, you know, is the clinical benefit that we, we see in the phase one just a reflection of patient selection? 
or will the stable disease patients actually lead to an improved survival in phase three? Um, we'll have to see. That was certainly the case, as James mentioned, with ipilimumab, the CTLA-4 blocking antibody in melanoma. That also has a very low response rate in melanoma, but was able to improve uh, median overall survival in large part because it created a substantial amount of stable disease that lasted for a while. We'll see if that's the case with PD-1 blocking agents. Another important question for us is how many of the responses will be durable off therapy? Obviously, some of them are, but will be they as long lasting as we see with IL-2 and ipilimumab, which last years um, in the rare patients that have those responses? Um, we don't know that yet because, as I mentioned on this um, curve before, um, while there are some patients off treatment, a lot of these patients in response are still on drug. So we don't know how many of those people, when they come off drug, will eventually um, progress. Um, and also, will some of these uncommon toxicities prove vexing? Um, they have in other, in, with other checkpoint inhibitors, particularly in kidney cancer, you might worry about things like nephritis and lung cancer. Pneumonitis is a big issue because many of the patients getting treated with these agents come to treatment with decreased uh, baseline lung function, cough, all, you know, all that. So it makes it harder to treat those patients with this class of drugs. But most importantly, um, since, the, since the benefit is probably only going to be in a subset of patients, how can we identify those patients before treatment? Um, Bernard also alluded to this in his talk, and I, I'd like to take on a few of the questions as far as developing predictive bar biomarkers. After a talk like Charlie's, you become a little bit discouraged that we can actually develop predictive biomarkers given um, some of the difficulties with tumor heterogeneity. But we, we tried, you know, we're trying to address these in our clinical trials, and we'll talk about you know, what we've learned so far. So one question is, does PDL1 expression alone predict for response? As Bernard uh, mentioned in his talk, the early data suggested that it might. This is from Suzanne Topalian's New England Journal paper from 2012, which suggested that if you had PDL1 um, expression, expressing on the surface of your tumor, you had a chance at responding to a PD1 antibody, but that if you did not, there were no responders in that group. But this um, analysis, as Bernard pointed out, was a very small number of patients, 42 patients, only five of them whom had kidney cancer. So what have we learned since then? Well, it, when you think about how we might um, treat patients with immunotherapy for kidney cancer, um, you know, one of the things that I think is probably going to be true when we look, you know, five years from now, for these patients with inflamed tumors who are PD-L1 positive, they're probably going to be sensitive to single agent um, PD-1 or PD-L1 blockade, and that's probably where we're going to use these drugs. But the, the, the story of PD-L1, as Bernard alluded to, is not a clear one. This is data that Dan Cho presented at ASCO last year. This is looking at the Genentech PD-L1 antibody in kidney cancer patients. I'm in a 47 kidney cancer patients, so a slightly larger group. Several interesting aspects of this. One, the response rate with the PD-L1 agent was somewhat less than we see with PD-1. We'll see if that maintains itself in future trials. But importantly, there was a, a small group of patients who were PD-L1 negative that respond. And we've seen this in other studies as well. So if a tumor is PD-L1 negative um, by immunohistochemistry, it doesn't necessarily mean they can't respond to a PD-1 drug. Where have we also seen that? Well, we, I mentioned the kidney cancer data um, with PD-L1. There's been a recent um, publication of data in melanoma, which suggests a similar story. Once again, a very small number of patients, so we don't want to over-conclude from this analysis. But here, the response rate higher than one might expect in pdl one positive patients. So it seems like pdl one uh, on the tumor might enrich for patients likely to respond, but still a fair number of patients who don't respond. So should we exclude those patients going forward? That's a, an area of debate. Um, there are many reasons why um, PD-L1 negative tumors might respond uh, to a PD-1 antibody. Uh, here's just a list of some of them. Um, I think Charlie's um, talk focused on one of the major players in this, which is uh, PD-L1 expression is heterogeneous, uh, not just throughout the primary tumor, but between the primary and the MET, and that's something we're looking into. Um, they also, the diagnostic antibodies are not necessarily ready for prime time. There needs to be a lot of work with them. Um, none of them are yet commercially um, available for uh, therapeutic use, but they may become available when some of these drugs are available as a companion diagnostic. Uh, and there's, there's other, other issues here as well, which I won't go into, but I'll try to pick off some of these issues 
uh, one at a time, looking at this area of um, tumor heterogeneity. Um, so if you ask the question is, does PDL1 expression reliably predict responders? I think at this point it doesn't. There are several interest, other interesting things that are being looked at, but m most of that data isn't published. Looking at, for example, the not just PDL1 expression on the tumor, but looking at the immune infiltrate in the tumor, looking at gene expression uh, in the tumor, those are all things that are being looked at but have yet to be published in conjunction with uh, these trials. Um, so getting back to the tumor heterogeneity question, will it complicate uh, biomarker development? Um, this is uh, the paper that uh, launched all of this concern. We started looking at whether or not there was an impact of discordance of pdl one expression in our group um, at Harvard um, from Sabina Signoretti's lab. Marcella Kalea presented data at GUASCO this year, looking at a very small group of patients, 34, who we had both a large piece of their primary tumor and a large um, excisional a biopsy of their metastasis. Um, we're starting to think that in, in looking at PDL1 expression, you need probably large samples to look at this because the expression of PDL1 is um, heterogeneous. It's also in inducible. Um, in, our, in our cohort, 29% of these patients were PDL1 positive in the primary. However, only seven of the 10 that were positive in the primary were positive in the metastasis. And there was one patient that was positive in the metastasis, but not in the primary. Um, so, in, and as I mentioned before, the PDL1 expression, at least in our hands, was very heterogeneous. And importantly, it tended to be positive in areas of high nuclear grade. So, getting back to one of the questions um, that was in, in the introductory questions about whether poor risk patients will respond to these um, agents, the general thinking is. It, that immunotherapy in the past has been best in patients with relatively indolent, low-grade um, low, um, disease. That may not be the case with PD-1 and PDL one agents. In fact, if expression is highest in patients with most aggressive disease, it may be those patients where these agents uh, would be most active. And that would be a particularly interesting and a potentially important finding for our patients. We obviously need to do a lot more work with that. Um, we also found that the PDL one expression, at least in our hands was more homogeneous in the metastasis. Um, and here's some examples of that. Here's looking at PDL1 expression in the primary tumor and the metastasis. You see some concordance here. But here's a tumor where it's, we thought it was negative in the primary and positive in the metastasis and positive here in the area of the highest um, nuclear grade. And here's just a look at the data in a, in a similar way, looking at the discordance in some patients between the primary um, and the metastasis. So if you're asking the question, will tumor heterogeneity complicate biomarker development for at least this biomarker, the answer is probably yes. And we need a lot more data, a lot more patients, and potentially bigger samples to look at than just needle biopsies of patient metastatic disease. Another important question with the excitement, some would call it hype around PD-1, PD-L1. A lot of patients with kidney cancer have been calling around, I don't know if you've been getting these calls, um, asking whether non-clear cell patients can enroll in these trials. Um, and for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, although it probably goes back once again to the his historical, whereas we generally think of non-clear cell patients as less responsive to IL-2 and less responsive to interferon, they've been excluded um, from trials of PD-1 and PDL one So for the most part, we don't know much about these patients. We, there are a few patients like this treated in the Genentech trial, but they've been excluded from the BMS trial. So the question is, should they be excluded? So um, Andre Fay, who's a, a fellow um, working at Harvard with Tony Shuari and Sabina Signoretti, looked at PDL one expression in non-clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Here's a group of about 90 patients with non-clear cell disease looking at expression as it relates to grade uh, and stage, but also histology um, in these patients. And what you see here, at least with this antibody, relatively low amounts of expression in chromophobe and papillary tumors. And I realize this is a ridiculously small number of patients, but of the seven patients with a translocation kidney cancer, three of those had um, higher levels of PD-L1 expression. So this is the kind of data hopefully we'll move in the future to allowing patients who had traditionally not had what we would consider immunoresponsive tumors on some of these trials going forward if their tumors are expressing PDL1. And I think that's a strategy that many uh, sponsors of these trials are starting to take in their development is um, identifying patients based on 
um, expression of pd one and hopefully that will happen in kidney cancer, particularly since some of these diseases are, are really hard to treat, affect young people. Translocation kidney cancer is something we obviously need to do a lot more work on. So should uh, non-clear cell patients be excluded from trials? Um, I would say we should rethink that um, and we should try to potentially develop trials in non-clear cell patients to answer these questions. So another question is, can biomarkers uh, guide frontline and combination trial development? This is something that I've heard Bernard uh, talk about before at, at meetings and has advocated for, um, you know, should we be doing this? Uh, this is the COMPARES um, study um, that he mentioned earlier, and Tony Shuari uh, presented an in, uh, an, a subsequent analysis looking at pdl one ex tumor expression on the outcomes of those patients in this trial, and I thought this was, result was pretty interesting. Uh, and what he looked at, this is just part of the data, what they looked at was looking at pdl one We know it's a prognostic marker for overall survival, but how did it impact um, response to VEGF TKI inhibitors? And what you see here is looking at PDL1 expression. Here's patients with low PDL1 expression on their tumors. Here are high, and both groups have been treated with either sunitinib or pazopinib. And what you see here are the outcomes in patients with PDL1 high tumors here do much worse with VEGF TKIs than those with PDL1 low expression. I think this is interesting for several reasons. Obviously, you don't want, once again, I think I've said this like six times now, you don't want to make too much out of this because the numbers of PDL1 positive patients in this trial are relatively small. But I think this might um, allow us a direction, uh, potentially, of getting these agents into the front line. You know, so for example, should we enrich our trials for patients that are PDL1 positive? More importantly, if if the agents are more active, um, if PD-1 and PDL1 drugs turn out to be more active in, in patients who typically don't um, respond to VEGF TKIs, that, I think that would be a truly um, important finding for our patients. We need uh, treatments for these people. Are these people the patients that Bernard was mentioning who have refractory disease? This would be not only an exciting way to get these treatments to the proper uh, patients, but maybe maybe identify patients who should get VEGF TKIs first versus those um, who should not. So r right now, I would think that we should be using biomarkers to get these agents into the front line. The faster we can get them there, the better, because ideally, people getting them front line, some of those patients would not need subsequent treatment. So looking at pdl one expression and response, I think the bigger problem with the field right now is not that pdl one expression isn't helpful. I think it is helpful. I think the bigger problem is regardless of whether you have pdl one up on your tumor or not, still the majority of patients don't respond to this treatment, um, which is what we've typically seen with many immune therapies. The bigger issue is that even in the best case scenario, the response rates may be two and three times in some studies higher for pdl one positive patients, but still oftentimes the majority of patients don't benefit. So going forward, uh, we talked about how inflamed tumors will likely be treated with single agent treatment. For those tumors that are um, inflamed, meaning they have pdl one expression on their surface, but don't respond, which is uh, quite common, what, else, what are we gonna do for those patients? And I would argue that we probably need to be thinking about combination approaches in those patients. Um, there are a, quite, one of the interesting things about combinations is one, PD-1 and PDL one are relatively less toxic than uh, prior forms of immunotherapy. So you can imagine combinations of at least two agents with PD-1 antibodies. But another important thing is many of the things here on my list, and this list could be twice as long, of things that you might want to combine with a PD-1 blocking strategy. Many of these agents are either FDA approved or in clinical development. Many of these agents have very limited single agent activity and are looking for something to combine with. So for example, um, we, we talk about different strategies that might work well with PD-1. Maybe we should be eliminating Tregs through antibodies that targeting CTLA-4 or um, GITR. Um, should we be inhibited, inhibiting myelo-derived suppressor cells? This is work that's a lot of it's been done at the Cleveland Clinic um, with Brian uh, and Jim Finke. Um, looking at should we be combining VEGF TKIs or other agents like HDM2 antagonists that might exclude myelo-derived suppressor cells from the tumor? Should we be supporting effector cells with agents like IL-2? There are newer versions of IL-2 um, in development that don't drive regulatory T cells as much, at least in preclinical models. And there are other more selective T cell agonists like IL-15 and IL-21 that could be tested here. 
Should we be supporting dendritic cell functions with GMCSF, those very interesting uh, randomized phase two data of ipilimumab and GMCSF in melanoma, which showed a survival advantage in those patients with the combination. Um, so it, could that be something we test in, in kidney cancer as well? Um, you know, going back to these or, the original questions that we had, I don't think that one of the exciting things about immunotherapy is the, the responses that we see are not necessarily disease specific. I mean, they may be able, we may be able to take something we learn from say melanoma and bring it to kidney cancer and have some positive effect and vice versa. I know that there are obviously other checkpoint inhibitors that are in clinical development already that may make sense uh, to combine. So here's an example of, once again, a very small study, in, this here in melanoma, looking at PD-1 blockade with nivolumab and CTLA-4 blockade with ipilimumab. Um, and this data is, you know, some of the best, um, you, know, st you know, stage four oncology data that I've ever seen. Um, this is looking at patients uh, who hadn't had treatment before, so this is probably a very selected group of patients. This is looking at their tumor shrinkage from the start of treatment. Um, and you're, what you're seeing here is the majority of patients, almost 50% are having a response. But not only that, the depth of response is pretty impressive. And the reason for, uh, that we get excited about depth of response, at least in immunotherapy land, is because it's these patients that often go on to have remissions that last years. Um, so small numbers of patients, very well selected patients, but there's a signal here um, of increased effectiveness of combining two checkpoint inhibitors um, in melanoma. Here, not only are the responses deep, but they're happening quickly. Here, the response is happening within uh, 12 weeks of treat um, starting treatment. But as with many combinations, um, they are obviously more toxic, and that's going to play a big role in developing these across uh, tumor types. Here's looking at the concurrent treatment and the sequence of these agents. We're, we're trying to understand how best to give them at the current time. But you can see grade 3 and 4 toxicity of, of 50% which is non-trivial, um, and, and you know, uh, patients need to be carefully instructed and very closely monitored with this combination uh, because it is toxic, but because of the clinical efficacy, this combination is already in um, development in lung cancer and in kidney cancer, um, and it's moving uh, quickly to phase th in phase three trials in melanoma. So one of the more interesting findings in this trial, not only was the efficacy, but here, um, looking at PDL1 expression and response, we talked already about how PDL1 expression seems to enhance your likelihood of responding to one of these agents. Here, looking from that combination study, admittedly very small numbers, so we're not going to get too excited, but the response rate in PDL1 negative patients was as good as it was in PDL1 positive patients. If this data is real, it suggests that adding ipilimumab is doing something to the tumor microenvironment that makes tumors more likely to respond. Could it be depleting t regulatory T cells? That's one possibility. We don't really understand it. But if, this, if we can take PDL1 negative patients and make them respond by combinations, uh, I think that would be an exciting prospect to move the field forward. Not only um, when you talk about immune checkpoints, the, the number of immune checkpoints or these so-called breaks on the immune system is enormous. Um, this is a, just a, a figure from a Nature Reviews article. But the interesting thing about many of these is they can be targeted with monoclonal antibodies, and many of these antibodies are already in the clinic in phase one. So here's an example of preclinical data that led to a phase one trial that's ongoing. This is from Chuck Drake's group at uh, Johns Hopkins. This is looking at the synergy between PD-1 blockade and another immune checkpoint called LAG3. This is looking in a mouse uh, colon cancer model, MC38. Um, in the control mice, they all do poorly fairly quickly. Adding LAG3, there's some delay in tumor progression. Adding uh, PD-1, there's further delay. The combination seemed to be better. Um, and now that combination is being tested in a phase one trial for multiple solid tumors. So when you look at the current PD-1 trials in kidney cancer, there are quite a few of them. If you go to ASCO this year, you'll see data on the phase two nivolumab trial, the biomarker study, this combination trial of not only PD-1 with TKIs, but PD-1 with ipilimumab will be presented. As Bernard mentioned, the phase three trial will have to probably wait until next year to see that. And there are several interesting trials that are being launched looking at TKIs and the Merck PD-1 antibody, which is at least as active as the BMS PD-1 antibody in melanoma and lung cancer. We're going to get our first taste of it here in kidney cancer and see how active it is. 
Um, and PDL1, in, in combination with uh, bevacizumab in a randomized phase two design against uh, sunitinib. And here, um, you can't really see it, but there's the lag PD1 antibody. So a lot of trials with data coming uh, quickly, um, it'll answer some of these questions, both clinical and some biomarker development questions. So if I had to look forward a year and make some predictions, not that you asked for my opinion, but I'm going to give it, about uh, these PD-1 pathway inhibitors, I, I think um, several of them will probably gain FDA approval in several solid tumors. That does not mean that the kidney cancer trial will be positive. I have no idea. It, it may not be. Uh, but several of these trials will likely be positive, and several of these drugs will likely be available. It's also likely true the PDL1 expression, um, both either in the tumor or in the infiltrate of the tumor, will uh, predict for a higher likelihood of benefit to these agents. But the majority of unselected um, PPI-treated patients will require salvage treatment. And why is that? Well, that's because of this, which is the non-inflamed tumor, which probably represents the majority of solid tumors out there um, in, in uh, most cancer clinics. And these are tumors. This is back to the Gajewski model again. This is a tumor that has a high expression of vascular markers, a lot of infiltration by macrophages, maybe these myeloderived suppressor cells, fibroblasts, not a lot of inflammation, not a lot of chemokines, not a lot of recognition by the immune system, not a lot of lymphocytes in this tumor. So you're not getting the effector cells at the tumor. You're not getting PDL1 expression. And this is the more common problem that we deal with. So going forward, we talked about different ways we might improve our immunotherapy. The biggest challenge for us next will be how do we treat these non-inflamed tumors, the tumors that are being completely ignored by the immune system. And one of the possibilities is we're going to have to do something to induce anti-tumor immunity. There are many different strategies to think about how we might do this, um, in increasing antigen presentation by combining immune therapies with things like radiation, for example, or intratumoral interferon using demethylating agents to increase antigen expression. It may turn out that some of these tumors with higher antigen expression may be more sensitive um, to, uh, to immune therapies. We also may want to improve the focus of the immune response through vaccines. There are two um, phase three trials with dendritic cell-based vaccines in kidney cancer. If those were to be positive, that would be an obvious next step for combinations in kidney cancer. But here's a look at how sort of predicting, um, you know, how we go forward is challenging. As Charlie mentioned, we don't have great mouse models um, for kidney cancer. We certainly don't have great mouse models for immunotherapy and kidney cancer. This is a Renka-based uh, model. That's, this slides come to me from Gordon Freeman. And, and what he wanted to, to look at is how do his PD-1 and PD-L1 agents work in a Renka model. And what you see here with both single agent it, mouse ipilimumab and mouse PD-1, very few uh, responding patients. It was only when he combined these drugs with irradiated Renka given as a vaccination that he saw activity. Um, so while, and if you had just, based on Gordon's models, you probably never would have developed uh, PD-1 or ipilimumab in kidney cancer. Um, but it turns out it might be a useful model for studying resistance. Uh, and it may be that, you know, vaccine plus checkpoint inhibition, as you see here, but what, with both mouse IPI and mouse PDL1, there was a slightly better outcome uh, in that setting as well. So more to come. Um, so, but ultimately, I still think this is going to be a subset story, meaning at the moment, it's the minority of patients that will benefit. So it's up to us to identify the patients who have the right immune response, the right tumor factors that allow them to benefit from immune therapy, and it's there that we should focus our um, efforts, still treating the most appropriate patients, not treating everyone. And this is an opportunity for us in the translational world to identify those patients. I think if we do this, I think we can, we can achieve Dr. Albigé's goal of more cures for patients with metastatic kidney cancer through targeted immunotherapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much indeed, David. No, stay there, stay there. Uh, I want to ask you a question at least, if no one else does. Okay. Um, that was wonderful. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Tim O'Brien, are you going to the microphone? Yeah, okay. Yes, Tim. Sensational talks, guys. Really, really enjoyed those. Thank Can I suggest a really crude way of switching on the immune system in a tumour? Yep. And that's to embolise it. There's some really interesting case control data that suggests that tumour embolised, not only do they have less bleeding during surgery, but you, you get an incredible immune reaction when you embolise a tumour. Fever, 
And, and I just wonder whether that would be a very crude but very simple way of switching on immunity in a tumour. Um, I think the short answer is yes, and I think the short answer is it should be tried. Um, but I think that the practical issue is the hard one, which is how do you get someone to sponsor a trial like that? Because, so for example, um, you know, you mentioned embolization. The, the folks who would argue for, that radiation does the same thing, that focused radiation will kill a tumor, um, release antigen, and produce responses. There have been anecdotal ex, um, um, stories of that effect. So it's a similar concept where you hit one tumor, release antigen, and you produce a, 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 a scopal response elsewhere. But actually organizing a randomized trial to do that is a challenge. Not to say it's not possible, um, but there's, it, it requires independent resources and very organized, very committed uh, individuals. So for example, we're trying to get a radiation plus IL-2 trial going for years based on just single institution data that suggests that's a good idea. It's been very hard to fund, pay for the radiation. You know, because if it's considered research, it doesn't get paid for. So what you'd need is, if it's, you, you would need to handle some of those practical issues. So for example, in, at least in the US, we can't um, do something that's not standard of care um, and not have a way of paying for it. Does that we make can't sense? just do the things the drug companies want us to do. No, I'm not we have to do what's right. The enemy is the disease. I'm with you. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying from a practical point of view. So for example, getting back to my radiation example, I'm, as far as I'm concerned, that trial should happen and it should be done. But what I'm saying is, from a practical point of view, for a trial to happen, it has to be supported at least some way, at least in a small amount. And so, for example, in the case of radiation, and I think this would be true with your ablation idea, is if the ablation is not considered clinically necessary, then at least in the US, who pays for it? So if no, and the answer is nobody, then the trial has to pay for it. So then the trial organizers, have to find a way to pay for it, and that's where a lot of these ideas fall short. I'm not saying they shouldn't be done. They absolutely should be done, uh, and it may turn out that the crudest methods are the most, the most efficacious because it, we have all these very sophisticated vaccines that are being developed where we think we know the antigen that we need to target. It may turn out that the antigen that's important from one person to the next is totally different, um, and you know, producing a storm of antigen may be the way to go. I'm just saying from a practical point of view, it's been very hard for us to get those trials off the ground. But I'm with you. They should happen. OK. The one last question I'm going to ask, if I may, because I don't think there's any others. So in melanoma now, for two or three years, I guess, we've had checkpoint inhibitors, which we can use in the clinic. Mm -hmm. And at least a single agent, they seem to be pretty well tolerated, um, along with targeted agents at the same time. And quite quickly, we've moved, I think, in melanoma to a paradigm where we're actually trying to use upfront immunotherapy, if we can, potential durable benefits. and then save our targeted therapies for salvage, bearing in mind some of the limitations we've heard about for targeted therapies already. Do you think in the next five years we're going to see that kind of transformation in kidney cancer? Uh, not as quickly. Um, I, would I like to see it? Sure. But there, are, um, but there are some issues. So in the melanoma world, there are many more believers in immunotherapy than there are in the kidney cancer world. Um, you know, and there was... so. There's a longer tradition of immunotherapy going back to interferon and uh, high dose IL-2. There are more people who want to believe that immunotherapy is an active approach that advocate for it, that push back a little bit on the BRAF um, targeted agents. And, and now we actually have some data that if you start in melanoma with BRAF, you might be preventing some patients from ever going on to get immunotherapy. Because in the case of melanoma, the disease is very often very aggressive and failing, as, as uh, Bernard pointed out, with failing VEGF TKIs. There are some patients who fail BRAF therapies. You stop BRAF, and they go downhill very quickly. So there's a, there's a sense that there's a window, as you pointed out, in melanoma that you need to act. The patients are young. The patients are motivated. They're willing to tolerate a lot of toxicity. They're, many of their um, um, doctors believe in immunotherapy. That's different than the kidney cancer world. Um, we need to change that, but one of the ways we're going to change it is if we can identify the patients who should be getting these drugs, not arguing that immunotherapy for everybody, but immunotherapy for the right patient. Once we 
if we can do that effectively, which we've not been able to do with IPI, we've not been able to do with IL-2, coming up with selection criteria, then we, if we can get them in the hands of people frontline, I think we'll make progress for a, for a group of patients. Okay, thanks, David. That, that was wonderful. Okay. So, um, the, this is the end of the session. The next session actually starts at um, half past three, and it's a satellite symposium. So, what I'd like to do is ask you all to thank uh, Charlie Swanson and David McDermott for two wonderful talks.